He said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. The parable of Lazarus and the rich man tells the story of two men. One of them has God the Lord as his master, and the other is ruled by mammon. The rich man is introduced first. He sports purple robes, the most expensive available. Moreover, he dresses himself every day in purple. He also wears high-quality Egyptian cotton in the ancient world used for underwear. Nothing but the best for our man. But he has a problem. Why the inner need to dress to the teeth every day? Well, apparently his desire is to impress the world with wealth and success, but it's never fully satisfied. As to food, he insists on sumptuous banquets, again, every day. Naturally, that means his staff is never given a day off. And due to their employer's self-indulgence, they cannot observe the Sabbath, dedicate themselves to hearing God's word. Thus, the rich man violates the third commandment, not only himself, but for his own employees. Let let alone also the spoken law of the times with the strict rules concerning Sabbath observance. And then what then of Lazarus? Lazarus is sick, unable to work, and apparently without extended family to assume full responsibility for him. The community, however, respects him and does what they can. At this, the rich man, at the rich man's gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus. That is, the community brought him before the rich man's gate. Because the rich man is the only man in town with the resources to help Lazarus adequately. Thus, Lazarus's friends carry, carry him daily to the ornamental gate at the entrance of the rich man's garden. The rich man and his guests cannot miss seeing him and passing by him. Perhaps they will help him. It's Lazarus' best and only option. But does their game plan work? No. And then we have the dogs. The dogs in biblical and rabbinical traditions are the most or almost as unclean as pigs. Dogs are kept as guard dogs, Isaiah 56, but never as pets. Only those who feed them dare approach them. A rich man needs such dogs because they are his home security system. The story assumes that the guard dogs are fed the scraps Lazarus longs to eat. So Lazarus goes hungry and the dogs are fed. Yet these wild guard dogs, whom no one but their handlers dare approach, Even the dogs are the ones who realize that the weak, sick man by the gate is their friend. They lick his wounds. The saliva of a dog's mouth is sterile. The ancients discovered that healing occurs more rapidly when a dog licks a person's sores or wounds. We know this is true. We've even uncovered, archaeologists have, in the Philistine capital of Ashkelon, a center where they have 1,300 dogs buried in individual plots. It was one such healing center. The site has been identified as a Phoenician semi-religious center where the sick could go, pay a fee, and have trained dogs lick their wounds as medical treatment. In this story, the master refuses to help the poor sick man outside his gate, but his wild guard dogs will do what they can. They lick his wounds. Their master will not help Lazarus, but they will. Lazarus's quiet, gentle spirit breaks through their violent hostility to humans. And these untamed dogs care for him, knowing that he cares for them. Amazingly, throughout all of this, not a peep from Lazarus. He says nothing. The New Testament has two words for patience. One refers to the patience of the weak and suffering, and the other identify, or de- defines the patience of the strong who have power over others. That first kind of patience, that of the weak and the suffering, is the patience of a victim. 
The second is the patience of a victor. The weak who suffer need, they, have, they need the ability then to endure. The word is often translated as long-suffering and is the patience of the oppressed who do nothing about hunger, hardship, and the injustice they endure. This describes Mary at the cross, by the way, and also, humanly speaking, is then seen in Jesus, too, who agonizes over enduring the cross while despising the shame. Jesus, like Lazarus, has no harsh words for all the evil forces that swirl around him. And then, like a clap of thunder, the drama quickly shifts. Lazarus dies and naturally has no funeral. He and his friends cannot afford one. But the angels are standing by to escort him to a banquet spread in his honor by the patriarch of the entire clan, Abraham himself. At the feast, Lazarus reclines on the chest of Abraham, that is, has the place of honor at the banquet table. The rich man also dies. He is buried. He had money, so he is given a funeral. No pauper's plot for him. No doubt it was a grand affair, but to his utter shock, then the rich man ends up in Hades. This is a classic pearly gate story that people use to make all sorts of astute political, ethical, or cultural comments about the ambiguities of life. But the dramatic surprises continue. The rich man sees Lazarus, recognizes his face, and can call his name, and thus he saw and even knew the sick man at his gate and chose to do nothing for him. But now the tables are turned. The rich man sees Lazarus in a position of authority and power at the right hand of Abraham and must make an abject apology to Lazarus, beg for his forgiveness. But then this is not what happens. The rich man, even in Hades, ignores Lazarus and addresses instead Abraham. Paraphrase, the rich man is saying, Abraham, I am suffering. This is not what I'm used to. When beggar types are hurting, it doesn't matter. There is always something wrong with them. But for people like me, this is terrible, and something must be done about it right now. I see that Lazarus is feeling better and is on his feet. Send him down with a nice, cool drink. Unbelievable. At this point, the story should explode with justice. Lazarus is expected to let the rich man now have it with every four-letter word in the vocabulary. Maybe we'll clean it up a bit. The gist of what he is expected to say, Lazarus, towards that rich man is, you no good half-dead dog. You want me to serve you? You can't be serious. Where were you when I was hurting? You fed your dogs, but you wouldn't feed me. I longed to eat the scraps that you threw to them, but no, I wasn't worth it to you. Abraham, leave this monstrous ego to fry in hell. What's he suffering? What he's suffering is less than half of what he deserves. That's how the story should go, we think. But again, Lazarus is quiet. In his day of power at Abraham's side, he has no vengeance to exact. On earth, each day for Lazarus was a journey of faith. Like Abraham, he went out daily, not knowing where he was going, not knowing if the Lord would provide or not. Of course, he would. Here, Lazarus exhibits, exhibits the other New Testament form of patience, the macrothemia. This is that other patience, not long-suffering, but the kind that puts away anger even in a day of power. Here is Lazarus, the victorious one, but who sets aside the vengeance he could right, rightly exercise. God was his master. His name was Lazarus, the one whom God helps. Only with the help of God, then, can he be long-suffering in this life and even put away anger far away from him, even though the rich man deserves it. And at the end of the story, the rich man retains his pride, even in Hades, his total self-centeredness and his indifference to any suffering other than his own. He recognizes the resurrected Lazarus, but even seeing him, he makes no impression on him. Thus, his claim that such a vision of Lazarus back from the dead would bring his brothers to repentance 
That's even hollow and vain. It hasn't done it for him. It won't for them either. And why? Even in Hades, Mammon continues to rule his life. At the end of the day, the parable offers a profound insight into the ambiguity of possessions of Mammon. While they can have an indispensable potential for good to provide food and healing for the man at the gate, possessions can also create and feed self-aggrandizement and in the process dull the sensitivities to both the rights of his servants and to the needs, that is, of Lazarus or to others. The root problem Jesus gives explicitly is that he trusts in his wealth and not in the word. As Jesus says, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them in the voice of Abraham. They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. What the rich man lacks is the indictment of God's law, showing him his sin, and the daily rich forgiveness of Jesus. And without that indictment, repentance for the forgiveness of sins, worked by the word on the Sabbath day, we'd be just as selfish and dead as the rich man. The Bible clearly shows that material possessions are not to be our God. They belong to God and not to us. What we do with our possessions profoundly influences every area of our lives, in this world and the next. But we wouldn't know that or even believe it unless God told us, and again, the Sabbath day. What the rich man did with his mammon colored, shaped, and finally destroyed him. Like an alcoholic, he was unaware of his self-destructive behavior, even in its bitter conclusion. Was what Lazarus was able to do without mammon then becomes an inspiration by the Spirit. Why? Because mammon doesn't save him. He didn't even have it. Nor can mammon or wealth save you from sin. Can't give you the resurrection from the dead and certainly cannot give you to live forever. Never mind what all the globalists with their human utopia projects think. Thinking he has everything, the rich man fails to see that he has nothing that matters. And having nothing, poor Lazarus has everything that actually matters. Because faith in the God of Abraham can and does save you. Faith, like Lazarus, trusts God the Father, who gives everything needed for body and life. If it be life today, good. If it be death, thanks be to God. Faith trusts in Jesus Christ, to deliver through his suffering and death, who has already opened heaven to all who believe in him. And that faith believes because the Spirit has worked faith in the heart, not by mammon, but by the preaching of his word. And trusting, then you are given to be long-suffering, patient, amid all pain, difficulty, loss, or like Lazarus, even in death. And trusting, you are given to put away all anger towards those who have much and even to those who have little and depend on you. They've, those neighbors have been placed before you to be cared for. So what is the world to you with all its vaunted pleasures? Nothing. Jesus, your priceless treasure, has already overcome the world, along with its sin and death and the devil for you. And he gives you now, in this very place and at this very moment, the spoils of his victory, your forgiveness eternal life, and salvation. Thanks be to Jesus in his holy name. Amen. We stand and we'll confess the creed. <clears throat> 